to you. Yeah, it just says wait, uh, wait for Pramit. This is a live recording now, so we should. Pramit, all yours. Hello. You're live. Okay. Um, uh, every <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Our session is on philanthropy in India today. Um, and we have three distinguished speakers to talk to us about this. Philanthropy is a very age-old, or charity, if you wish, is a very age-old Indian tradition. The Bhagavad Gita, for example, has a line where it says that those who have surplus, but who do not give to the needy when they are in surplus, are no better than thieves. Um, and we, of course, uh, in modern times, the Tata Trusts, uh, Jamshedji Tata, was a contemporary of Andrew Carnegie, Joseph Roundtree, all of whom were in many ways uh, the, the forerunners of modern corporate charity and philanthropy in the Anglophone world, at least. Um, and today, of course, we have one of the world's largest uh, universes of non-governmental organizations. Uh, Indians are, despite a relatively low income, among the highest givers of, of, of uh percentage of people in, give, in terms of give to charity or to donations. 84% of Indians, which means a lot of very poor Indians, give at least once a year, um, even though only 30% give to registered charities. But it is a reminder that the vast bulk, if you wish, uh, of charity, at least in terms of the people involved, are to uh, the religious foundations and other organizations, which are not necessarily part of our normal universe of philanthropy. But the tradition is very strong. Um, <clears throat> both family corporate, fa family businesses, large corporations, religious uh, groups, and then even family, uh, intra-family donations are, are extraordinarily common and taken almost for granted, I would argue, among all Indians. To speak to us both about what they see uh, as what modern Indian philanthropy is about and and on their personal experiences. Um, I have three speakers, uh, Sundar Mahalingam, uh, head CSO at HCL and at the Shiv Nader Foundation, um, Priyam Bhudia from the Patton Group, and Sushil Premchand, MD of PRS, uh, who's out right now presently in Switzerland. So maybe I'd first turn to Sundar and ask him to give his views. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, in terms of this is a very interesting topic. And as you know, um, he set the ball rolling in terms of philanthropy being quite a, in a sense, at least a well-established practice in the country. And uh, but my feeling is that it actually came of age a few years ago. There are lots of uh, uh, first generation entrepreneurs who, uh, who took advantage of you know technology and, you know, telecom, et cetera, those, uh, those areas. So and many of them were first generation entrepreneurs and many of them I think became uh, what I call uh, successful because of education and you know um, other other uh, things that that really helped them. So with that in view, they I think many of them felt that they should give back to society. So I think that's that's been a nice trend to my mind over the last uh, from the 90s onwards that people have started thinking about giving back and uh, lots and lots of people have to my mind earlier lots of philanthropy was there, but much more private, I would say, more maybe to temples, maybe to organizations of their own, uh, uh, what I call, setting up. But now, uh, in the last 20 years, lots and lots of people have started giving. It's, and as uh, Pramit mentioned, it's 85% of uh, people have given at least once a year. So that's a very good trend in a sense. And add to that, if that is philanthropy, um, about um, uh, five odd years ago, the government of India looked at corporate social responsibility, CSR, and uh, sort of mandated that... Uh, large organizations should um, give 2% um, of their, uh, of their uh, uh, net profit to, uh, to, 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 to CSR charitable works or so, so socially relevant works. So that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, almost a, a game changer in a sense, because one, of course, is lots of funds were coming in from uh, the philanthropists, both the old and the younger ones. But also you had uh, now uh, a sustained set of funds that are, that were, or are reaching uh, the people and India does need a lot of philanthropic help and a lot of uh, CSR help if you were lots of issues that I think we still need to work towards so so that's that's been a good trend and if I were to think about the right time now it's about let's say six seven years after 
the CSR bill was passed. I mean, there have been many changes in since, but essentially 2% of net profits is the, the key point, and that's a significant uh, quantum of funds that is reaching the, uh, the Indian populace, right? So uh, the good part is now the fund is there, funds are coming in, and uh, uh, from the perspective of the NGO community or the people who need these funds, I think there's now the, an alternate source of funds. So that's the, the good aspect. Um, uh, my thinking, and this is uh, something that I think about, is that there's still room for what I call um, uh, being more standardized and more process-oriented in a sense. Because when you talk about corporates and uh, uh, people who have to give funds, the CSR law, many of them uh, are business drivers. So they are used to taking funds and looking at funds as, uh, to, uh, does it create impact? What are the measurable goals? What are the, what I call, uh, the key metrics uh, that define um, a, a successful, how does it say, investment in a sense, right? So, which was not something to my mind that the, the general NGO community or the, the receiving community has been used to. I mean, yes, to some extent, some of the larger NGOs, yes, but if you talk about the rank and file of NGOs, many of them maybe were not used to this aspect. So, this is the time, to my mind, is growing and evolving where, Lot, there's much more need for governance in this space. When I say governance, I mean from a perspective of uh, um, how do you ensure that the funds that are being given are being used well, are being, and there is a certain amount of impact measurement uh, that happens. And that is uh, given that uh, companies think like this, so that, that really helps a company uh, in that sense. To my mind, the companies also have helped in the process of uh, letting some of these uh, organizations do this, but there's still a uh, very distance to go, um, you know, in terms of how this can this can happen. And uh, I think many organizations are working at that. So, so that's the uh, one thing. So there's, there's now more funds. It's a great thing to do. There are, uh, as it's sort of mandated, it's um, um, uh, the use of these funds are something that people are looking at quite strongly and it can only help. Uh, how this, are these funds, I think the biggest challenge right now is to think about how best can these funds be used to ensure that you know, overall there is development um, for, the, for the country, for the key goals that we need to aim towards and um, sort of bring it all together. So that's something that we should look at going forward. So Pramit, if I could hand back to you, I think that's probably what I just wanted to say in my opening. Thank you. One of the things, though, at some point, maybe with some of some, but some of you could touch on later, is as you mentioned, governance is a big issue. Uh, it helps corporations definitely in being able to target correctly, but it also raises compliance costs. And if you incorporate that with existing various government regulations and a whole host of other fronts on philanthropy, uh, it may question how much money is actually being diverted into administrative issues and compliance. But before I turn to that, Priyam, I'd like to. Turn to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be at this illustrious event. And it's my first time at Harassus and uh, share this digital stage with such a distinguished panel. Thank you for the lovely welcome. Um, in my view, philanthropy in any form is really a vehicle of social change. As corporations, it is our duty to usher, rather, chauffeur in show for change in by not only taking philanthropy from point A to point B, but also to newer, greater, reimagined heights. And why behind philanthropy is key, coupled with long lasting impact. And I believe that true transformation is only possible through a continuous increasing level of awareness at the macro and the micro level. And to that end, I'm, I'm happy to share a story about my philanthropic journey. It all began on a sunny afternoon. The first time I saw Gita, or rather Gita found me, I was six years old and doing something I had been explicitly told not to do, climbing a tree in the backyard. I was lunging for the higher branch of the mango tree and instead of shooing me down, she helped me up. And of course, immediately my new nanny proceeded to become my new best friend. After high school, I moved abroad to pursue educational and professional opportunities. After seven years in the UK, I returned for good to join Patent Group, our over four decade old family business, which manufactures water storage solutions as part of one of its many verticals. The first person I went to visit was Geeta at the village where she had retired. We were having a wonderful time catching up when her daughter-in-law hesitantly walked in to say that they were running late to go collect water. Seeing the confused look on my face, Gita explained that her rural village had no piped water and hence the women 
needed to go to the tube well at the other end of the village. This took at least four hours each day. As I saw Geeta, her daughter-in-law and two granddaughters who had to skip school for this, gather an assortment of buckets, paint buckets and jerry cans to set out in this quest for water, I got misty-eyed. Ever the firm but lovable nanny, kind of like an Indian Mary Poppins, she handed me a bright yellow jerry can and asked me to make myself useful. Moved by Geeta and her village's inability to easily access portable water, my team at Patton Group and I committed ourselves to finding a sustainable solution for transporting and storing clean, safe, hygienic drinking water. The solution was Water on Wheels, an ergonomic 90-liter roller tank with a tight-fitting lid and a handle. So how did our unique solution help? It improved water hygiene, it reduced the risk of neck and spinal injuries, it reduced the gender barriers by increasing the number of men helping with water retrieval, it saved time. Earlier, they walked nearly 365 days a year to fetch water. Now, it's approximately only 72 days. This has empowered several women to take up vocational courses and start micro-businesses. The attendance of, at rural schools, especially that of female students, has increased. So my path to empowering rural women and children via sustainability projects has been paved with CSR based on the social entrepreneurship model. CSR, according to me, augments, amplifies and complements philanthropy and it is both a modern and appropriate mechanism of corporate giving. It fundamentally redefines giving, not making it synonymous with financial charity and focuses on harnessing and deploying time, resources and effort, not just money, for greater good. And I also feel it concentrates on being charitable over giving charity. And it gives back twofold, not only helping the demographic in need, but also all stakeholders across the value chain, right from investors, employees to consumers, which boosts the overall economy. CSR ma helps magnify the impact of philanthropy. Because of CSR, I could help not just my Gita, but many more. If this had been a personal project limited by my own funds or at the mercy of donations, I, it would not have been able to change the lives of millions. Legally mandated CSR in India is just the starting point. Organizations can either pay lip service to it by doing the bare minimum and donating the stipulated amount or delve deep and ingrain CSR into their core values. The changing face of philanthropy is promoting long-term CSR to transform gatekeepers of wealth to creators of wealth. It's time to view individual philanthropy and a growing culture of CSR as the intersection of positive impact. It's time to create a sustainable triple bottom line, people, planet and profit, fueled by passion, purpose and perseverance. It's time to look beyond sympathy, beyond empathy and build a culture of compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. One of the things that you said, you, what you showed, of course, is that you began your philanthropic actions well before the 2015 law was passed. Um, and I think this is an interesting question is that if tomorrow the government were to repeal that law, how much of corporate India uh, would continue uh, philanthropic charitable uh, activity simply because they recognize that it has a broader good, not only for their own company, for their employees, but for society as a whole. But before that, we'll turn to Sushil, um, who is speaking to us from on uh, behalf of P. Yes. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Priyam on a very eloquent summary of her journey, but also on the whole approach that they've taken at patent to provide these uh, ways of moving water, which is, for all the reasons that you mentioned, the start of an interesting journey. And I think that your comment on the triple line really echoes very well with a lot of what's being said today. So my congratulations and thank you for the comments. Let me start with two definitions. The first of philanthropy from the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the desire to promote the welfare of others, especially through the donation of money to good causes. In Fowler's etymology, there's a complementary comment, which is philanthropy is the benevolence towards mankind. 
This is a historical definition of the term of philanthropy. The legal definition of corporate social responsibility we've addressed already is not really relevant to my mind, but I just want to make the point that there's a difference between philanthropy and CSR and the requirements of the companies and organizations that work in that area have to respect the need to help the environment and the people and the organizations in very many different ways, such as Priyam and uh, Sundar have explained. For me, the classic comment was made by a very well-known journalist, Sir Stanley Reed, who was the editor of the Times of India from 1907 to 1923. And his comment was, when I think of Bombay, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I like to recall not only the beautiful city itself, but the men who made it. This is the introduction to a film on the Merchant Princes of Bombay made by Zafa Hai, where some of us were involved, who really uh, believed in philanthropy. And these people, these four men, really believed in philanthropy and giving back to the city from which they had made their money. And I believe that is a difference to CSR because it is CSR being a legal requirement. These people had no legal requirement and they just did what they thought was right. And they gave their profits from their business activities back to the people. So it is a reflection of family values that is philanthropy. The legal requirements in CSR are not necessarily determined by family values. And that's one of the points that I think is very important. I'll talk a little later about some of my experiences in philanthropy. But the point really is that I've been Im 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 imbued with the whole concept of philanthropy that our family has been involved in in different ways from my childhood onwards. Today, my concern is there's an over-reliance on CSR, its regulations and its rules. That conflicts with the notion of modernizing Indian philanthropy, which was rooted, as we've said before, in tradition. I still believe there's a deep tradition in uh, it, Sorry, there's a deep tradition in uh, the concepts of philanthropy, not just in India, but everywhere. In the Catholic Church, for example, tithing is a normal process. In Judaism, people are expected to give back to society, uh, often at the level of 10%. And I think today a societal change is taking place where many people reflect much more on themselves than on the world around them. I'm of the opinion that philanthropy is something that has got forgotten at times and that CSR is used as a cop-out by some. I'm not trying to undervalue the importance of CSR. It does provide a consistent stream of 2% of profitability. There are different rules that describe how much has to be given, but that's for major corporations. Uh, it doesn't really apply to smaller companies such as ours. Uh, and I believe the total amount of the CSR pool is, I think, $2 billion. It's a huge amount of money that's now ended up in that, in that CSR pool. And that's much more than ever was there before. And that's very important to help people. But it's a means of supporting the poor. But Frank's initial commentary was that, you know, should we be viewing the, pure as, the, the poor as customers? I don't think that's right. Uh, we have to look at the mutual environmental and overall societal benefits of CSR. The focus does need review. And that's been partly done through the legislative changes that we've had. But we have to figure out in our minds that giving back to society is different to helping the poor and those in needs. There's an essential So Shini, go on mute. You may want to. When did you last hear me? About a minute ago? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. I'll carry on. The, uh, the point I made about education is that there is important to have education, especially for the girl child. And my great grandfather was involved in that exercise going a long time back. But it, you have to find a balance between the spirit of giving and the legal requirements. We have to encourage both. But let's not forget that there's a moral requirement, as I see it in the concept of philanthropy, and a legal requirement under CSR. And you have to fuse the two in some manner. It makes it easier to give corporate funds, but people who are involved in corporate environments could easily and give uh, substantial amounts of personal funds should they wish to do that. In India, there are only two people who are in the, uh, the, the I think it's, it's the Forbes has a list of a global donors list and is Azim Premji and Jamishiji Tata, the only people who have appeared in that in that century. 
and we have the opportunity to give much more. I don't think we've ignored philanthropy, but I think there's an opportunity to refocus on combining the two factors, which is what, what Priya was trying to suggest. I look forward to this conversation and apologize for being on mute for part of the time. Thank you. Well, I think that's the, that you know, raises this interest, as you mentioned, philanthropy versus um, CSR. Um, and the question I think for many of us would be, does that really matter? Does the difference really matter in the end? Perhaps a legal requirement of CSR will develop, result in a genuine sense of philanthropy um, uh, that, uh, as Sundar was mentioning, didn't exist for a lot of companies earlier. And, I, and I, I sort of hypothetically said, what would happen if they actually lifted the law? But Sundar, why don't I turn to you again um, and give some further thoughts uh, about this issue? Um, so let me pick up on what uh, Sushil was talking about, philanthropy versus CSR, right? <clears throat> Firstly, as far as CSR is concerned today, it's, uh, to my mind, at least the large companies, or at least the, the, the reputed noted companies, know the benefit of giving back to society. It's not, I mean, while the requirement may be mandatory, but uh, every, every organization worth its salt has been doing CSR for far longer than the uh, than the law actually said it was supposed to be done, though the quantum may have been yes or more depending on the individual organization. Secondly, the world, as we know, is changing. There's much more what I call responsibility that corporates need. So there's a greater focus on the triple bottom line, on ESG, on you know various aspects. Uh, and uh, companies have realized that um, uh, customers or people or suppliers who are they, like to work with good companies. Like I remember my boss once telling me that, you know, that people, uh, uh, when I go and meet a customer, he says, I'd like to work with you because you're a good person, you know. And and um, uh, so so this while, yes, I mean, maybe um, uh, the government needed to make this law and, you know, uh, get people to sort of, you know, actually start thinking about this. Because till then, maybe it was, because it was not mandatory, it's okay, fine, something we can do if we want to. But then now that, so there's some serious... Um, thought and the board is involved, boards are involved in most of the organizations, is involved behind CSR. And there's a board committee for all, I think all district companies have to have board committee uh, for CSR, right? So with that in view, I think it's a great thing that uh, there is this, and, and uh, anybody, I really don't see a, what I call a conflict, as you mentioned, between philanthropy and CSR. Philanthropy can only do a certain amount and uh, CSR can have, uh, obviously do much more, it's much more focused in that sense. One last point I'd like to make, Pramit, in this one is that ultimately, and this is again something, again, it was, uh, Boss once told me was being shivnar. He said that the government is the largest philanthropist in any any country. Is the government which has to do at the end of the day? Any private organization or philanthropic person can do a certain amount, but at the end of the day, is the government which has to take the what I call country forward. So what does what can a philanthropist or a CSR activity actually do? They can create what we call um, source codes or uh, you know proof proof uh, proof points saying okay so and so activity. This village, I want to do something so and so village. Um, I did this, and and um, this is works. Maybe this can be replicated other places. Maybe through other organizations or through government or whatever. But the point is that that's the the role that uh, ultimately, to my mind, is the it's like a nice balance between personal individuals who are doing for their own benefit and hopefully benefiting of CSR. CSR as a more organized force because it comes with certain, as I mentioned, you know. Um, um, need for measurement, so to speak, and find the government is so hopefully will take this and bring this together uh, as you know good examples and how that can be replicated further. So I, I do this is the best way it should go. That's that's my view. Thank you. So Priyam, would you like to <coughs> chip in as well with your thoughts about any of the any of the points that we've been discussing so far? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I feel that you know the why, uh, the why of philanthropy. It's it's shifted from the social, um, the socially conditioned, obligatory done that we used to do in the olden days because of image and status building, or maybe for a feel good factor, um, or maybe even for religious reasons, perpetuated by priests injecting fear into our minds of to do volunteer, you know, to voluntarily, uh, to do voluntary responsibility. And that is now evolved into more like self-actualization. And earlier, the words that we used were 
um contribution donation charity sponsorship because it was essentially only financial but in the modern marketplace philanthropy is fundamental to business growth and it's not a cost of doing business it's rather an investment in the community and the brand um and i feel that when when you legally mandate csr um what happens is that something which as i said in my previous example that you know is something which i could have done at my personal level um the moment it's legally mandated it it just the whole effect amplifies uh, the tangible the intangible impact or uh, it becomes more scalable it becomes sustainable or uh, there's a structure to it um so i so i'm totally for the view that you know this legally mandated csr of 2% um it's it, it's something which encourages organizations to um creates that culture amongst all its employees amongst its stakeholders uh to go and do their bit of csr and i just like to you know share sort of my uh examples um in in this pure besides the uh patent projects that we do which actually comes under patent foundation um so most mostly i follow the social entrepreneurship model because i feel it's a scalable self sustainable easily applicable model and it's an excellent way for organizations interested in hands on philanthropy uh to make a grassroots level impact and also for value creations from scratch um just to cite some examples from some of my csr initiatives which actually align with our core business values it's built on the foundations of empowerment or atmanirbharta and health 360 and these projects have a personal connection um my younger sister prachi is a special needs child uh with adhd low iq and bipolar disorder and she really is the inspiration behind the drive to leave a legacy of lasting impact my mom and i our first foray into csr was caring minds which is an institute of mental health uh this is a one stop affordable easily accessible 360 mental health care solution for one and all across the globe next for us came i can fly which is an institute for special needs individuals which provides academic and vocational training to the intellectually challenged individuals and our latest project which is about 4 years old which i'm really happy to share actually is cafe i can fly and um, this is a cafe which is run by special needs students of i can fly um, and this is a venture which i co-founded with my mom it's an inclusive sheltered workplace and it serves as a 24/7 awareness tool to break the stigmas and bash the taboos surrounding the capabilities of intellectually challenged individuals so i feel that all of these initiatives which are part of patan foundation along with my um foray into water on wheels which comes under uh, our sustainability vertical called embracing green um coupled with some of the rainwater harvesting projects which i've done across multiple states in india um we always kept in mind to adopt the 10 we adopted 10 of the 16 global un sdgs across all our projects to make sure that every drop counts um and we began with one vision but collectively we've been able to touch over 30 lakh lives over the eight, uh, over the last 8 years and that is the part of csr um and lastly to end i just say that we are on the verge of creating a global legacy of giving that holistically meets the people planet and profit challenge uh, we are at the precipice of a defining moment and being a part of this discussion it's been absolutely amazing with uh, such notable panelists and it's been an amazing experience for me uh and yeah these are my views on legally mandating csr versus individual philanthropy excellent thank you priya like lots of as you, you continue to give perfect examples of on the ground uh micro philanthropy uh, which affects as you said in this case 3 million people uh plus it means now when i go to my home city of calcutta which you happen to share uh, i have another cafe to visit so sushil i turn to you i would give a different view on philanthropy in that sense you know i think that one of the activities that takes a lot of my time is to actually help organizations with my business experience which dates back over decades to think about how to get funds in for what they're trying to achieve in things like healthcare if i'm for example was on the council of the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine which is a world leading body uh in 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 healthcare and infectious diseases We're now on the court there which has been restructured to be a fundraiser and it's interesting where you can use business experience 
to talk about the benefits of subscribing to uh, projects in that area. We, I mean, the, the school has an annual budget of about 200 million pounds a year uh, and no endowment, and that's a sort of crazy situation. We're also involved with the uh, the, well, sorry, the CSMVS, I always call it the Prince of Wales Museum, because that's what we donated to, but they changed its name for various political reasons, which there's no merit in discussing on this panel. But the, uh, the, uh, we, we supported their efforts in renovating the museum in terms of the East Wing, which was basically a water-logged area, and a museum needs to have a dry area for anything. And so I'm now involved in, in a centenary program to create an endowment for the, for, that, for the CSMVS in Bombay. And again, one is giving time to encourage others to also to give. We've given, but the objective we have is to get others to give much more. And there was an earlier session today with, uh, I think one of the best sessions was with uh, uh, Abhishek Podar, who's founded a new museum in, in, in Bangalore with Kiran Mazumdar. Uh, Firoza Godrej and with uh, Sunil, um, uh, the, the hero, the, the hero company uh, vice chairman. I mean, basically, there's uh, a, the ability to give time and give experience. I think is worth its weight in gold, where you can actually persuade people to think differently. Uh, and a much smaller example, I was involved with the Swiss Foundation which was supporting a charity in Benares, right near the, the, the Ganga. And they had been given money to build a fish pond by some group in, the, in Holland. And here I am visiting the site, seeing a huge fish pond right next to the Ganga. And I said, what is this pond for? Oh, for fresh fish for the kids. It's a children's organization for people with handicap. I said, but there's fish in the river. Why do you need, well, we've got money for that. And it gets back to the point that Sudan made on governance. That was a clear demonstration of a lack of governance by the people running that particular charity. And I think that people like Gates have done a fantastic job in demanding governance, uh, not in terms of added overhead, but in terms of making sure that you ask for money that you need and demonstrate that you use it for that purpose and that you then get compliance as a result of having systematic governance in place. I think that's an important role, both for philanthropy as such and for CSR as well, so that you have accountability. Um, it was another institution where I was asked to give money and it was a government-linked association. And I said I would happily donate if there was full accountability and I never heard from them again. Um, uh, it was uh, I was not surprised <laughs> uh, because the, the last thing they wanted was accountability. And these are, these are issues that, that are causes of concern to me. Uh, and I think that with the development of the legal basis of CSR, uh, you have an improved governance factor across the board. Another example is we have ancient family trusts. Some of them were founded uh, 150 odd years ago. One of them were Jains, and one of them was to feed Jains. When, we got in, when I got involved with the family business, which was not that you know, 25, 30 years ago, I said, why are we feeding people who can perfectly well feed themselves once a year with a slap-up meal? The trust deed does not specify feeding uh, rich Jains who can afford food. So we've restructured the way we handle that by saying we, we need to look at people, especially those who are not able to tell people they need help. Uh, we have people who will tell us that XYZ needs help. We don't want our name associated with that. But we make sure that they get not not money, they get trained for twice a year uh, from a good source. So there's no stone in there. They get value for money, and the appreciation that you get from activities like that, which are very micro level, very focused, uh, using networks in a certain in a, in a rational way, uh, add personal satisfaction, but also add value to the community, maybe in a focused way. But at least these are all steps towards getting. Uh, value for money uh, from generations of having made money. Let me stop there. Pramit, can I comment one point of Sushil, yes. if you're, unless you... Thank you. So um, I think Sushil made a point about how he had uh, uh, talked to an NGO and then told them come back. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I want uh, as to how you count the blow, whatever, and they didn't come back. Now, 
there are two it's not necessarily the fact that they didn't what i call want to come back what we have noticed is and it's a foundation the csr mahav works with more than 400 what i call uh, ngos for top ngos and i'm talking about top ngos many of them do not know how to come back they have thus far many of time haven't been looking at this in this lens there's a group of young people or what are young old what are people who are motivated who are passionate who want to do something and they just go ahead and do it right but then it's only really they start thinking oh this i need more funds how does that happen or i need to be accountable how does that happen so at times i'm just saying the uh, reason the person came back did not come back to you may not have been the fact that they did not want to come back to you, they did not know how so that's another thing which uh, um, csr and uh, let's say large organizations organizations can do to sort of help this uh, this uh, ecosystem may I respond to that comment sundar because uh, it's very interesting that you say that because in this particular instance with the fish pond that i talked about the people knew perfectly well that they didn't need to dig a hole and fill it with water next to the ganga so they they knew how to get back to us because they were uh, trying to avoid criticism they're not very happy when i visited there to be honest with you but to give you an example of people who then need money i mean there's i've involved with the singalan university this there's, there's a thing called the singalan symposium and there's a contingent of indian students who write essays usually at the last minute but they have a total of about 200 students who get paid to come for free for a week to switzerland at the symposium and uh there's been a change in and I, i organize a for the 20 odd indian students and maybe 10 business people who attend this uh it's about 1000 people the same level of participation as the world economic forum but much less uh stultified uh much more interesting and much more relevant to my mind but still uh there there's usually a round table with say 20 or 30 people uh linked with india and the students there have over the years instead of wanting a job in government or wanting to become a slave in an investment bank as a uh young startup or they then migrated to being uh, looking at multinational companies and then the next stage was we want to start our own business in the last slot have actually wanted to do something to give back those who helped them get educated there's one one guy who um was fed up with the the corporate world and was working somewhere uh and had his had a laptop in a in a small town somewhere and he realized that people kids were looking at the 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 tea shop across his shoulder and one day one of them said can i borrow your laptop So he was not very happy about that so they said well can we borrow your phone so he let them borrow his phone and he realized that they were actually auto dictates they were teaching themselves how to use these things and then it developed into an area where he called developed thing called nooks where he had a little little space that he rented where people could come and experiment and play and build things repair things a sort of circular economy argument in part but it was just a way that he was able to uh stimulate interest and then the next generation started coming the grandparents started coming into these nooks and so that's the sort of thing that we've been very helpful to support but we've been very clear that when we help him he has to tell us what he wants the money for how he's going to use it he is a business graduate so it's easy for him to do but he then infects this concept with other people who are creating nooks on his uh, model So I think there's a learning curve there and I think it it one that works to my mind. But you're right that people don't have a clue but we have to then teach them. Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing in modern philanthropy in India uh is the fact that there are now so many layers uh, of what's happening. Uh I've been on across the table from some of the biggest philanthropists in Silicon Valley, California discussing what they would like to do or what could they do in India. regarding climate uh, which is now of course a huge issue uh, but for them it's more about very policy oriented things how do we influence government because there's ultimately a limit to what you can do on the ground uh it's really about a much larger game on the energy sphere and so on but they're still philanthropists but they know they're entering a political minefield when they go in there uh and in fact one of them got banned afterwards and had to help them um, get themselves unbanned it took 3 years um but the point is that you have that level and now you have something like keto or or change.org working at your at your cell phone uh, beaming you and asking you for 20 rupees and a, and a signature um and it's based on an enormous degree of micro 
micro mobilization, uh, if you wish. And then, of course, you have layers and layers in between. And I could see that a lot of people get confused. If you're used to giving to a temple or, or a masjid or giving to members of your own family, where you have a pretty clear idea and a personal basis about the integrity uh, and of, of that organization or the people involved, uh, and where that money is, what that money is going to be used. And now you have these systems which are much, much further away um, from you. Um, and let alone if you're a government official who's supposed to be monitoring all of this and saying, wow, we have the world's, I think India still has the world's largest NGO network, uh, many of whom barely function in terms of they don't audit, they don't do anything, they fill out that Society Act form, which is one page uh, written by in Victorian England, and then they give that and then they do whatever they feel like. That it's incredibly difficult. Modern philanthropy in India will work on a, on a huge number of levels. Um, and it strains both individuals, corporations, and the government. Um, so we still have a few minutes left. Would anybody like to comment? Priyam, would you like to say something about what you see as where philanthropy in India could be going or anybody else jump in? Yeah, I just feel that, you know, um, say someone, the way, way my, um, the way my grandfather or like someone in their generation or like the way my father would do philanthropy, um, you know, individual philanthropy versus the way um, say someone like me or in my generation would do it. It's a bit different because maybe like um, say someone like my grandfather who's built uh, schools and hospitals in Rajasthan uh, and, and in you know Delhi and in Calcutta and all of that. So it's it's more of a one-off intervention because say you know he's he's earned his um, he's earned you know his he's earned his money. He has some wealth and then he feels that okay, what do we do with this money? for his own goodwill and it makes him feel good. It's a feel good, feel good factor to do something for the community. So it's a one-off intervention. Whereas there are no KPIs, there are no metrics as such. It's just like, you know, you know, giving that money off for the greater good. Whereas someone, whereas people in my generation, when I talk to people sort of in the 25 to maybe 45, um, I see when we, we think of doing CSR, um, we would like it to be more hands-on as in it's not a one-off intervention. It's more of um, really being involved in terms of not just money, but uh, time, energy, and then, you know, the two-way accountability um, and really knowing where the money is going and then having tangible metrics for that. And, uh, and then seeing, you know, change happening uh, over time and making a scalable impact. That's how I feel is the difference between how, philanthropy used to happen earlier versus now. And another interesting point I'd like to make is also, um, you know, in the olden days in India, um, and, I've, and I think it even happens now, um, when somebody in the family passes away um, or, you know, you, you move into a new house, um, there are like priests who come in and then, you know, they sort of inject this in your mind that due to re religious reasons, you should do philanthropy or you should do that. You should give a certain amount of money or you should like, you know, give away these materialistic things because this will sort of make you um, lead a better quality of life or things like that. Um, so I just feel that this is how it used to be earlier. But as everyone's becoming more conscious and more aware, um, these things are going away. And now it's about doing what you want with your own money. It's, it's, it's freedom of choice yeah. for everyone. Well, we've come to the end of the session, but I think what Priyam, you point out is really that the, the issue remains that whether you were doing it in the original temple or you're doing it in a modern uh, corporate situation, you still want to have trust in what's going on here. That that remains universal. Well, thank you all of all of you for for the, this this uh, joining us in this panel discussion, um, and um, hopefully we'll we'll meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the comments and uh, look forward to keeping in touch in some manner. Thank you. Great. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.